Hi, how are you? It's great to have you. Okay. I, I can't hear you, I think. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we're good now. Um, <laughs> yes, well, CZ, you have certainly made a lot of headlines this week and just in general. And as soon as this morning, I saw that Binance had suspended deposits of USDC and USDT on Solana. So I just wanted to start there asking you about the news. Why did you make the decision to do that? Um, actually, I, I'm not sure of the details on that one. Um, our team made the decision. I, I would assume there were some issues with Solana Network or something. Um, I don't know the details, actually. I was at a conference in Milken in Abu Dhabi yeah. uh, while that happened. So I actually need to ask. Got it. I, I saw you met Paris Hilton at the conference. That's, that's really fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, seeing her later. I'm seeing her later for drinks. Yeah. But look, all, all eyes have been on you this week, obviously. And there's been a lot said about the sort of you know, Binance and FTX situation, FTX is collapsing now. And I'm just curious, how do you feel this will hurt your business? Oh, yeah, um, it will hurt our business and the industry in multiple ways, well, and the consumers. Um, well, first of all, the co many consumers are really hurt financially. Um, they have money stuck on FTX, etc. cetera. Um, that's gonna really shake uh, confidence in co uh, trust, credibility in this industry. So now people withdrawing funds from centralized exchanges and the volume will decrease. Um, the regulators all around the world will be scrutinizing us very heavily going forward. And uh, <clears throat> getting new licenses around the world is gonna become much harder. So uh, we'll have a lot more education to do. Um, we do need to uh, increase transparency of our businesses significantly. That itself is actually a, probably a good thing. So um, this is gonna be like a lot of, neg a lot of impact, uh, short-term negative, Long term, I actually think many of them are actually going to be positive. How dependent is your business on trading volumes for revenue? Well, um, that's pretty much 90 something percent of our revenue. So um, it goes up and down with the Bitcoin price. Uh, the Bitcoin price is pretty much an industry index. And being a larger player in the industry, we, we follow that pretty closely. Um, but that, we're okay. So we're, we're still running a profitable business today. Um, we're okay. Yeah. You know, the one thing that I can't seem to get out of my head is after watching all of this unfold, I mean, I know you've talked about this before, but there's, surely you must have seen some of this coming, right? When you we made those tweets, I mean, it had such a huge impact and you've been in the industry for a long time. So some of them, I can do mental mathematics and kind of um, have some, some suspicions, but it's very difficult to not understand what's going on in a different platform, in a different business. Um, it's only, for me, I was very surprised by the amount of money that they lost and the amount of customer funds they moved and the state of things there. Um, I mean, before this, I can do some mental mathematics. You know, based on our revenue we can, uh, and our relative size, and, their, um, and we can estimate their revenue, which is quite small because they charge lower fees. Uh, we know most of their public spendings. Uh, we know how much they spend on you know, stadium naming rights, um, referee jerseys. Um, marketing budgets, etc. We can. All, we also know how much funds they raised, uh, which is not much, to be honest. And then we also know. Uh, we kind of. We kind of have a rough idea, but we never know for sure because they could be doing something different. Right. I guess. Did you know that your words would have such a large impact on the market? Absolutely not. Um, I thought. Look, we're just saying. Look, we're just selling some uh, FTT tokens, and it wasn't a huge stash. It was like you know three percent of total supply, and we said we're going to sell. We're gonna sell it over over a period of months. Sure, but, uh, but you're highly influential in the crypto industry. There, like, surely you must have seen it coming, right? That uh, all no, of this would actually, set off a firestorm. I, no, actually, honestly, I do not. I do not think it. I do not thought, think it. I, I still don't think I have that much influence. I think we had. We were the last straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, it's not the straw that's really really strong. Um, it's this thing has been building up. Um, people, um, there's a long chain of events that led to this. People have been losing trust in FTX. Many other people were suspicious of the activities going on. So there was many things that's building up to this thing where we were, the, I was, we were, we may or may not have been the, uh, the last trigger. It may be something else. To be honest, even if I didn't make that tweet, this whole thing could still happen. So it's not to say that the, the last straw that, you know, have, su have such impact. So it was the buildup of the lack of trust in FTX and people's suspicions. People don't like the way that, you know, the DeFi regulations were proposed by them. There's a whole bunch of stuff that built up to it. Uh, I just, ha I may have happened to be the last thing that poked it. 
So you were talking earlier about how you are pretty dependent as an exchange on trading revenues. Are you planning on diversifying that at all? I mean, how are you going to prevent against that sort of risk of revenues falling because people don't have confidence in crypto anymore? So if we want to diversify our revenues today, we can quite easily do that. We have quite a large number of portfolio products. Uh, you know, we have coin market cap. When we acquired coin market cap, they were making three million US dollars per month in ad revenues. We removed all ads, so there's no banners, no pop-ups, um, no other projects advertising the ICO on coin market cap. It's a much cleaner experience. We can turn that back on. Um, that'll give us forty million dollars a year, um, and we but we don't need to today. Uh, we have trust wallet. Um, we can charge a little fee for transactions. We don't need to. So I think today we're still profitable. We're still very healthy. And um, we want to lower the barrier of the friction for people using crypto uh, tools. We want to get more people to use crypto. So today we don't see the need. Um, but if we do, um, we, have, we have many products. We're, we're, we're not, we're, we're, right now we're single revenue, but we're not single product. We have many products we provide for free. Uh, just for, to increase the speed of adoption. But if we want to monetize those, we could. And is that something you see happening maybe in the short term as some of the pain continues with FTX and there's more fallout? Um, no, I, I, don't, I don't foresee that happening anytime in the short term. I think we're still very healthy uh, financially. Um, we're, we're, we're quite solid. Uh, we, have a, we, we have a fairly large cash reserves, which we use for acquisitions, investments, and helping other projects. Uh, on our day-to-day -day operations, we're still profitable. So um, I, and I don't see any need for, digging, for, for, for turning on other revenue uh, uh, metrics. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I do want to talk about reserves um, later. But first, you mentioned this point on regulation. In your opinion, are there any regulations that could have prevented the FTX collapse? Um, I wouldn't say prevent 100 percent, but it could have reduced the chance of that happening. Uh, if, we, if, we, if, the, if we had stronger audit on reserves, uh, on how, how money is used, how client funds are, are saved. If we have more of those mechanisms, this thing probably could have been prevented or reduced. Um, there's never, it's never 100%. When a guy wants to lie, um, there's many different ways he could fake the data, <clears throat> give you false uh, information, et cetera. So I think regulations help, but um, it's never 100%. Is better auditing of reserves something you would recommend regulators start doing and start implementing? Uh, I do. Um, so we do recommend that. But understand that FTX has been gap audited in the U.S., right? So they somehow fake that and somehow fool the auditors. So um, just in this particular case, I'm not sure. I think those things, more audits are really good, but I'm not sure if they will prevent this particular case because we never know how this one guy will, will react to that. So I want to ask about this um, industry recovery fund that you are putting together do you know at this point what the size of that is projected to be? Um, I, with different numbers being, uh, so it's not set in stone, different numbers being thrown around. Mm -hmm. I've seen numbers around $2 billion, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure if that's enough or that too, that's too much. Um, we like to take a more flexible approach where, look, let's look at how many projects do need uh, this money and how many good projects we can identify. Um, there may be a lot of projects that, you know, that, that just want money, but they may not be good enough for, for us to put to put funds in. We want to help the strong project, uh, projects um, that are just in you know, a cash crunch. So we don't know how many they are uh, completely yet. So we, uh, as time goes on, we need to talk to each of these projects and, and find out more. Yeah. I know one of the big considerations with FTX, you know, when they were bailing out all of these other crypto exchanges that were having trouble, was that they were sort of doing that in order to cover up some of their own issues. And I'm curious, watching Binance sort of try to do the same thing and bail out other players in the industry, what is in it for you? When the industry gets bigger, our revenue gets bigger. So we <laughs> want to save it. We don't want the industry to become smaller. Uh, when FTX did some deals like Voyager, FTX, when we were bidding on Voyager, we saw all the data. Uh, FTX owed Voyager 530 million US dollars. Uh, we were bidding on Voyager at the same time, but we don't owe Voyager any money. So um, we don't owe anybody else in the industry any money. So, but uh, we still want to save uh, the good players in the industry so that the, um, the negative impacts in the industry is minimized. Uh, consumers are protected and then consumer confidence returns. Hopefully the industry will continue to grow. Will you be compensated for providing those funds directly in any way? Um, well, there's different ways to uh, get compensation. We can take equity, we can ask for other things, or uh, we can just say, look, so some projects, for example, if it's a, um, 
if it's a blockchain development project, um, so open source system, we may just say we uh, we give grants all the time too. So um, the different way, different projects may have different situations. And and you're considering all of those options at this point for the fund. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. There have been rumors that you are looking into bailing out Genesis. Is that something you are considering at this point? Um, I can't comment on specific deals. Um, um, I would assume that uh, they would be NDAs in place. Um, but we are looking at a large number of projects in, in the space. Almost every project that you hear about in the news, they would have talked to us. Got it. You know, I think one big question that has come to people's minds is just, you know, if this happened to FTX and they fell so far so fast, you know, what's to say that the same couldn't happen to Binance? And, you know, your balance sheet has billions of dollars worth of your own tokens on it as well. So doesn't that make you vulnerable to the same issue that FTX was vulnerable to? Um, that's absolutely a valid concern. I think all of those, and that concern applies to every business, not just in crypto. So I think as consumers, when we're using platforms, especially if you're storing money onto a platform, including a bank, you should ask those questions. So I think those are very valid questions. But in the blockchain world, every, things can be much more transparent. So we're doing that proof of reserves, which using like uh, Merkle tree um, so that people can verify that the assets are included. And we have full reserves. Um, and so, uh, with, uh, so there are many ways to be more transparent. We publish our code wallet addresses. Um, we are now working with multiple regulators all around the world on how to do this audit more transparently and more automatically. So uh, we're doing a number of those things, but um, every user should verify on their own. And um, if you don't trade often and you can hold crypto on your own, do hold crypto on your own. Um, but holding crypto on your own also have certain risks. So uh, yeah, but we want to be as transparent as possible. Um, the risk is always there. Uh, but I think today, Binance, we have 100% reserve for user assets. Operating assets are completely separate. We have a large reserve uh, for that as well. So I think, knock on wood, we are in a pretty health, we're, we're in a very different situation than FTX. Um, so, but just because one uh, company is mismanaged in an industry, doesn't mean every other company is mismanaged. But people should- Well, that's verify. true, but that, that is the concern, right? If, if the, yes. there's the same sort of vulnerability. I yes. mean, you have talked a lot about transparency in the, the past week or so, and yeah. you know, yes, you've released the proof of reserves, but at the end of the day, you're still a private company, you're banned from operating in the UK, you're under investigation in the US from, for money laundering, right? Like, how but can users sort of trust you, given all of that? Don't take, don't take no, information no, from Rubini and Rebetum. Uh, those, are, those, are, those are wrong information. I cleared it up the, today in the Abu Dhabi conference. Uh, we're not, Binance is not banned from operating in the UK. Binance does not have a license to operate in the UK. That's different from being banned. Sure. Um, UK right. as a Commonwealth country it allows reverse solicitation. As long as we don't solicit, like advertise in UK, if a UK user come to us, uh, it's fine. But, but so, why don't you have the license? Uh, we own, like so we're the most licensed platform in the world uh, globally. We have 15 licenses globally. Many countries don't haven't issued that many licenses. So um, um, so that's that's just a state of things uh, today in the in the world. Uh, we are sure. working collaboratively with the FCA. Um, we have we have we have ongoing dialogue dialogues with them. We would like to get the license, um, but today uh, we don't we haven't got it yet. But we're we're not banned. Uh, those things are different. So uh, don't take what some uh, the news too verbatimly um and you in the us um uh, we have binance us has 44 state licenses um 10 of them are like are granted in the last 12 months so um that, that basically sh shows you the status of things in the us but yeah sorry uh, what was your question yeah I, I guess all i'm asking you is given this backdrop of you know all of these different sort of maybe issues going on with regulators in certain countries how can users be certain they can trust you? When you speak about transparency, how do they know that you're actually being transparent? Yeah, so there's many, so regulate, having a license increases trust, um, but it's not a 100% thing. It's just that it doesn't, like many, many licensed entities, Madoff is a licensed fund manager and they lost 10X more than FTX. Um, so having a license increases trust, but it's not guaranteed yet. Um, trust is still built over time with your actions uh, and with your technology. Uh, we, in this industry, we have many technologies that can uh, allow people to verify on their own. So um, with those technologies uh, being more and more deployed, uh, I think the trust will increase. So this, trust is not a like, simple one, one flip switch. Uh, flip switch. Um, FTX has many licenses in the world. 
And guess what? Um, they were lying. Right. So uh, yeah. So I think we we just we, uh, there's many different aspects to trust. But I think as long as we continue to operate ethically, transparently, and always protect our users, our users are pretty smart these days. Like information, social media is pretty, 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 pretty fast and pretty, pretty good. So um, yeah, I think uh, th there's no magic solution, and we just got to earn it over time. What more besides releasing proof of reserves needs to be done for companies to regain trust in crypto? I mean, one, one thing that comes to mind is even crypto.com had released their proof of reserves, but now there are some questions being raised about the legitimacy of those. I mean, is releasing your proof of reserves, first of all, is that enough? And second of all, is there anything more that needs to be done in your view? Oh, yeah. So re uh, uh, publishing your cold wallet addresses is just one first. Uh, actually, it's a very short-term uh, temporary uh, um, a method. It's actually not a... It definitely doesn't mean like just because you publish your uh, uh, code wallet addresses, you're 100% uh, guaranteed. And as we have seen in certain cases, there's the actually increases the amount of questions uh, when things right. don't really add up. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, proof of reserve is not the only one. Um, how secure is your wallet structure, infrastructure? What kind of technologies do you use? Um, your custody solution? Um, how, like, it's just many, many things that, that, that needs to be done. Um, even how you handle customer disputes, in which, in which situations do you compensate users or not compensate users? All of these things are like topics that needs to be addressed over time. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's many, many topics, but to, like, you know, a month ago, a, a week ago, people were very focused on loans, uh, stable coins, sure. uh, because that's yeah. UST Luna. But now, given FTX, now this focus, uh, the latest focus will be on reserves. Um, but there's many other things we do need to focus on. We may or may not be, as an industry, fully focused on them yet. But, you know, people learn from recent events. Um, so that's kind of how we evolve, yeah. All those measures that you just talked about are those things that Binance has already released? Um, pretty much. I mean, we have a very good, pers uh, like we operate at scale. So we have, we believe, best practices for all of those things. And we actually would like to share many of them to make them industry standards, uh, like how we manage wallets. Um, and I think we have one of the most secure technologies for managing wallets. And we also manage the largest wallet in the world. So uh, we like to share some of those best practices. Um, so there's many things we would like to share, but you know, we can only do one thing at a time. Today is proof of reserves for the next couple of weeks. We'll get that done and then we'll, we'll move on to the next one. Sure. Yeah. I, I want to zoom out a little bit and talk about the theme of decentralization. I think a lot of people in the past week have seen decentralized exchanges as a solution to some of the vulnerabilities that FTX was facing. I know you have said in the past that you sort of believe both can coexist, but how is that possible? Um, so look, in a decentralized world, if, if, if you and I collaborate together and form a company or form whatever, right, that's centralization. So in a, in a fully, in an extreme, fully decentralized world, everyone's on their own. That's the most decentral, decentralized distributed. But, but, but in, in that, a, in that world, do you have a business? Because Binance is a centralized exchange, right? Maybe, maybe not, but that's a hypothetical situation. But people will work together. As soon as two people work together, is that centralization or not? That is kind of centralization. And if, 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 if a company of 2,000 people works together and they build a platform that many other people like to use, um, in a free market, there will be some centralization. And um, so decentralization doesn't mean everyone just com are completely isolated and everyone's equal. That's communism. That's communism. Um, that's different from capital capitalism. That's different from free market. So uh, this decentralization versus centralization concept uh, should be viewed in a balance. Today, we have centralized entities in both the traditional financial world and also in the, um, um, also, also in the crypto world. And tomorrow, it's going to be the same thing. Hopefully, over time, more the technology will allow more of more of the tasks to be able to be uh, done by individuals, so that we are moving towards decentralization. Today, if you ask everybody in the world who does not have crypto to hold crypto on their own, they are not technically capable of doing that. I think you and I know that already, right? right. So, if we just force people to go from banks directly to DeFi. Uh, most of them will lose, will lose their own money because they misplaced it or they lost their device or they don't know how to encrypt it, etc. So that's not the best way to grow the industry. So the, today, not, more people will be more comfortable with email address, customer support. Um, so this is why centralized entities still, still exist. So I think it will coexist for a while. Do you believe that we'll eventually get to that point where it's a fully decentralized system? Uh, so again, I think uh, when we say fully, decentralization is not black and white. 
So it, like, how do you decent, how, how, how do you define fully decentralized? I guess all, right, all, so all I'm I, asking is like, is Binance effectively just sort of an on-ramp for people into crypto? And then once they use the centralized exchange, they end up, you know, moving to a decentralized exchange like a Uniswap or something of the sort. Um, I would love for Binance.com to be that role. Um, I, I do believe if we look for a bit further into the future, 20 years uh, or more, I think the, a lot more people will be using a lot more decentralized technologies that will be built over the next 20 years. So we would love to be that on-ramp. Um, and but doesn't us, that long-term threaten your own business? Uh, no, we, uh, we have Trust Wallet, which is a decentralized wallet. We, have, um, uh, we, have, we, have, we contribute to multiple blockchains. Uh, in, there's more, always more opportunities in the future than there were in the past. Just because we have one business that's making money today, doesn't mean we'll have to hold on to it forever. Uh, there will be it, more business it. models that we can make money in the decentralized world too. Um, that could be even more valuable. So uh, we just, we just, we, but it's just the market for that is small today. So we're not working on that today, but it doesn't mean we can't work out on that tomorrow. So we're not, we're really not afraid of losing a centralized exchange business uh, when the time comes. Um, there'll be many things to do. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one thing that's on everyone's mind is no one saw this, or a lot of people didn't see this FTX collapse coming. And you saw it, you almost sort of predicted it a little bit earlier, it seems, right? You were one of the first people to shed light on this issue of their reserves. What parts of the industry do you think are vulnerable right now? I mean, what's next? Um, well, I think uh, may, many other exchanges potentially have, uh, have some, may have pro exposure to FTX going down. Now, FTX going down, um, there's rumors of Genesis having, well, Genesis post withdrawals. So there's rumors of their liquidity issues there. Yeah. Uh, and now Gemini may be affected by that. So um, there's multiple uh, interdependencies in the, in the ecosystem. I think people should look for much more in, uh, independent, well-run, isolated businesses, which you know, Binance.com is, is, is one of those examples. We don't rely on other third-party uh, loan providers, et cetera. So, and the loans, um, uh, loan business is high risk um, in the industry. So uh, any loan platforms um, are at high risk. I'm not saying that all of them are going yeah. to have problems. A, a few may, uh, most of them will be fine. So um, other than that, I don't like this in any industry, especially a new one like, like, like ours, um, there's many, many risks. Um, even in the internet industry, there's many risks. In the traditional industry, there's many risks. Um, so yeah, I mean, <clears throat> in Lebanon, the bank stopped withdrawals, right? So the banks stopped working like a, for a month. Um, same thing, Ukraine, well, Ukraine's kind of recovered a bit. Um, so yeah, there's many risks in many different places. I won't be able, to be honest, everything's, everything has risks. So I won't be able to name all of them. Um, it's just that people should understand that risk is not a black and white thing. And then they should learn to judge the level of risk for themselves because they are more familiar with the things they interact with or use. And that risk management mindset is really, really important. Don't put all your eggs in one basket and always have a backup way. And um, yeah, the, I can talk about that for, for, for a long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we've talked a lot about the FTX um, news, but I want to ask you about something else that Binance is involved in, your global exchange. And I wanted to know what plans, if any, you have in India, because I know you had this deal with WazirX that ended up not working out and there was a lot of water under the bridge there. Are you planning on doing anything else in terms of expanding in India right now? Um, to be honest, um, today for India, uh, I don't think India is a very crypto friendly environment due to the tax, uh, due to the high tax. So if you're going to tax 1.2% per transaction, um, there's not going to be that many transactions. Um, so if, like a user who trades 50 times a day, they, they, will, they will lose like 70% of their money. Um, they're just not gonna. They're, they're not gonna be any volume for high for like an order book type of exchange. So we don't see we have a viable business in India today. So that's why India is one of the countries I've not visited this year. Um, so we just we just have to wait. Uh, we are uh, in conversations with a number of uh, um, industry associations, um, people, uh, influential people. We're trying to to put this logic there. So look, if you charge high tax uh, percentage wise, you're actually gonna get less tax overall. Because this, you're gonna high, you're gonna charge like if you charge 1.2 percent of zero or one dollar, you get like 0.1 cents. Yeah, yeah. And whereas if you charge 0.01 percent of uh, 10 billion dollars, you get a lot, of, you get a lot more in taxes. So we're trying, uh, we're trying to get this message across. But you know, uh, tax uh, policies typically take a long time to change. So we're waiting for that policy to change. Binance goes to countries where the regulations are pro crypto, uh, pro business. 
Um, we don't really go to places where it's really we can't, we won't ha we won't have a we won't have a sustainable business, or we won't have any business regardless of whether we go or not. So India, unfortunately, given the tax situation, we we have to wait. There's obviously the, the regulatory issue in India, but I'm wondering if the Wazirx deal had anything to do with you pulling out of that market. Uh, Wazirx actually less so. Um, you know, Wazirx um, it was you no know, investment where there was some issues, but you know, business deals have issues sometimes. So that itself yeah. doesn't. That, <laughs> That's for sure. That, that, yeah. Um, that itself doesn't doesn't cause us to leave an entire market. Where, whereas we, we look at the policies or, pol uh, or regulations in that market today, we just don't think we don't think we have a viable business in India today. One other question about Binance and your business: how are, how do you list tokens on your platform? How do you decide what tokens you're going to actually add? I mean, I know yeah. other exchanges have people have their thoughts and opinions about their process, so. Yeah, yeah. So um, I wrote an article from four years ago uh, <clears throat> about uh, if you Google um, Binance CZ listing, uh, CZ's Binance listing tips, um, you, you, land, you land on, on the blog article. Um, there's a number of things we look at. The number one is how many users does this coin or product a project has. If it has a large number <laughs> of users, then it, um, yes. if a product or project have a large number of users, then it has value. Um, the more something people uh, uh, is used by people, the more the, the value it has. So that's the number one criteria. But even that one, how do you measure users is tricky. Like do you measure daily active addresses? Do you measure TVL? Do you measure Twitter followers? Um, so we use a combination of things because if we publish one metric, uh, people will game it. Um, and in addition to, uh, to number of users, we look at product market fit, um, how strong are the teams? Um, there's, there's a number of metrics we look at. Uh, we are, we're actually extremely selective. Uh, we list about less than one percent of projects that that apply to us. Um, so um, yeah, and um, uh, we have, we do have a selection process that's relatively public. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so uh, we we go by that. There were rumors late last year that um, <coughs> excuse me, losing my voice a little bit. Um, there were rumors late last year that you were looking to raise money for the global exchange. Is that still something you're open to taking external investor money? Uh, we considered it, uh, so uh, when you run a business, whether to raise money or not, is always a question you ask yourself. Uh, it comes up once um, every month or every quarter or so. Um, we, are not, we, ha we have our own cash reserve. We're still cash flow positive. So we're not in a cash crunch, like we, want, we have to raise money. Um, but we looked at uh, whether uh, raising money would help us strategically. So we're still considering <laughs> that good. always. Um, we wouldn't rule that out, um, but it's something that we are not like, you know, it's not like if we don't raise money, we're going to run out of money in the next six months or so. So we're, we're, not in that, uh, we're not in that situation. A year ago, it was a better time to raise money. Um, the valuations right. are higher. A little easier. Um, there's more money flowing around. Today is a less interesting time to raise money. Today, we should invest in other projects instead of raising money ourselves. The valuation is lower. Um, Etc. But we're not ruling that out. Uh, we always have. Uh, I think as a CEO, as a founder, there's always discussions here, and, here and there. Um, but uh, we're not super serious about it. But we always, you know, had chatting about it. If you weren't considering raising because you needed capital, then why consider raising at all from external investors? Um, well, the, many many investors have a, a lot of uh, connections, um, uh, policy influence, um, government uh, government backing. Uh, uh, or um, uh, uh, regulatory influencing, or they could be they could own banks and, and other things. So uh, partnerships, etc. So um, there are many advantages in having more people uh, on your cap table in, in addition to just you know money. Um, so yeah, so I think there's many there's many different potential reasons. Yeah. My last question for you is about regulation. I. I think a lot of people in crypto, a lot of leaders say, we want more regulatory clarity, we want industry-friendly regulations, but at the same time, there has to be balance with protecting against some of the things that we saw unfold with FTX this week, for example. What, in your eyes, is a you know, smart and helpful regulatory framework for a company like Binance to operate in? Oh, um, there's quite a lot. <laughs> Um, uh, just on top sure. of my head, um, I would say number one would be classification of crypto. Don't classify it as one asset type. There are certain coins that look like a security. There are certain coins that look like a commodity. 
Bitcoin is more like a currency. Um, there's uh, other utility coins. So make sh so th the first one is like not my, not narrowly narrow minded to uh, to sort of uh, define cri all crypto assets as one uh, asset class, a traditional asset class. Um, that's not what, that's not what crypto is. Um, then the second thing is of obviously to allow exchanges to operate in in uh, in, in, in in those countries. Um, ideally, with uh, offerings on spot uh, futures, uh, earn. Um, pay, Binance Pay, payments. Um, um, the products allow us to offer the product we already have today and maybe more. Um, and then um, KYC AML is important. Everyone's, almost every single regulator is doing it. Um, and But more on the operations of exchange. Um, what are the ways to store uh, wallet security? How, how do we ensure that? Um, <clears throat> uh, um, asset proof of reserves. How, how do we do it? Um, that will come. Um, whether stable coins are allowed, uh, or what type of stable coins are allowed, whether ICOs are allowed, we of course prefer ICOs are allowed because we think that's one of the killer apps in in crypto. Um, whether you know NFTs, meta, uh, metaverse, uh, gamify, or uh, what 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 are the parameters in those areas, um, and taxes? How do we tax um, transactions, uh, capital gains, um, corporate income, etc.? We want clarity on those things. Um, and uh, uh, so this may, this many. So we we would like to have uh, permission to do all of those things with um, a, a, a with a very strong degree of um, uh, transparency uh, declaration disclosure. So I think disclosure is completely fine. Uh, transparency is completely fine. So uh, we like want regulation to, see, to uh, compel transparency. You're talking about exactly. Got it. Yeah. So and most importantly, banks to, uh, allow banks to work with crypto exchanges. Uh, many banks are still kind of skeptical. They don't have instructions on whether they should or should not work with crypto exchanges, and they take the conservative route. So by now, by now working with uh, crypto exchanges, which is actually damaging for them longer term, uh, they're going to miss out on this new technology for money. So um, yeah, so uh, there's many things for for a friendly regulatory framework. Um, yeah, and we have conversations with, ma with many regulators all around the world. Uh, things are improving even today. Well, thank you so much, CZ, for your time. I think that's all we have. I could ask you questions all day, so appreciate you sitting down with me. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Anita. Yeah, thanks for having me.